We're live from the Al Newharth Media Center. My name is Devin Martin from the Cross Media Council, here for an event called Be the Change with Senator Larry Pressler. Please join me in welcoming the Senator and also Chair of the Political Science Department, Dr. David Ernest. Thank you all for being here. Uh, this is a very special evening. South Dakota has enjoyed a distinguished history of public servants, but I dare say few of them have amassed a record that equals that of tonight's guest. Larry Pressler is a native of Humboldt, not far from here. He is a 1964 graduate of USD with a degree in what was then called the Department of Government, now called the Department of Political Science. And while he was here, he served as the president of the student body. He was a Rhodes Scholar studying at, I believe, St. Edmunds Hall in Oxford, and uh, subsequently went on to study at the Kennedy School of Government and at the Harvard Law School. After his Rhodes Scholarship in 1966, he joined the U.S. Army, where he served two tours in Vietnam. He then worked as a Foreign Service Officer for the U.S. State Department. His election to Congress in 1974 was remarkable. He was a successful Republican in a year when anti-Nixon sentiment led to Democrats picking up 49 seats. He served two terms in Congress before winning three terms in the U.S. Senate, where he served from 1979 to 1996. He was the first Vietnam veteran elected to the U.S. Senate. Among his noteworthy achievements was something he didn't do. He was the only subject of the FBI's ABSCAM investigation who did not take a bribe and, in fact, reported the bribery attempt to the FBI. Among his many legislative achie achievements is the eponymous Pressler Amendment, which arguably shaped U.S. nuclear non-proliferation policy for at least two decades. Please, once again, welcome Senator Larry Pressler. So I should start off by thanking you for your service uh, well, to our you. country and thank you for being here this evening. Um, I, I wanted to start with uh, a topical uh, question. Uh, you have experienced, by my count, half a dozen or so election nights as a candidate for a public office, uh, on, on most nights as a winning candidate, but on a couple occasions as a losing, a losing candidate. Uh, what thoughts did you have on Tuesday night as you watched the election returns? Well, first of all, thank you very much for having me here, and uh, I see so many people, including Dave Lias, who grew up uh, not a, just a half mile away from our farm in Humboldt, but he's now the distinguished publisher and editor of the Vermilion Plain Talk. Oops, where'd he go? He just disappeared. Oh, he's back there. In addition to being the editor, he's also the photographer. <laughs> and I thank you so much. I'm so honored that you came, and that you mentioned me in a little article the other day, and that fed my ego so, so much. Thank you. <laughs> uh, but my neighbor, isn't it funny how, how uh, uh, we in South Dakota, we tend to underrate ourselves or think of ourselves as being very remote or very uh, something. And uh, here's Dave Lias of the famous Lias Holstein Farm, half a mile, a gravel a road near Beaver Lake, and there he is, the pillar of Vermilion, <laughs> the, uh, the publisher, the editor of v v Vermilion Plain Talk. Yeah. Um, so I thank you for coming, and I see Ted Munster, and I see a lot of people that uh, I've known for a long time, and a lot of young people I met today for the first time, and I'm just thrilled to be here. And uh, uh, now I'm supposed to have a message, uh, uh, so I'll give my message, and then I won't forget to, get to give it. But my message is really that there is a thrill of public service, that if you go into uh, public service, uh, you won't make as much money. But there is a, a thrill of trying to do something for your community. And you might do that in a foundation, or you might do it working for the government or running for office. And that is a uh, uh, part of your pay, is that thrill of trying to have done something. And um, uh, so I've had that thrill. However, you can end up uh, not being a poor former senator, but uh, I'm probably, I'm the only former senator that you'll probably ever met who's not rich. So, uh, and my wife reminds me, 
But in any event, I've done a lot of teaching and, and other things, uh, working on foundations. I've just, I'm just back from India, where Ted's daughter has a foundation, which I haven't done much for. But I'm on a foundation where we're trying to eradicate leprosy. Believe it or not, there's still a lot of lepers. And I, just, I was down in the state of Bihar in India and uh, other points. And um, uh, I actually bathed a leper, and we cut some of the things off of some of the lepers. It grows like a, uh, a fingernail or something like that. It's kind of a, it's a biblical disease. Christ, uh, the famous story in uh, the New Testament, he, uh, he uh, uh, cured 10 lepers one day, and only one of them thanked him. And that was the point. So maybe that's where I feel about my senatorial career. <laughs> <laughs> let, me, let, me, let me follow up on that. When okay. did you first know you wanted to pursue a career in public service? Well, I wanted to go into foreign service, and I did. Uh, uh, when I applied for a Rhodes Scholarship and all that stuff, and by the way, a, a lot of that stuff, if you're not a Rhodes Scholar or not a graduate of Harvard Law School, don't worry about it. You can do better. Uh, as a matter of fact, the people who get turned down for Rhodes, they keep on working. And the ones who get one, then they, they slack off. But uh, <laughs> uh, uh, So you can be successful even if you don't go to college for, uh, even if you don't graduate. Uh, there are opportunities. But I mean, I urge you to graduate. But all this academic stuff I've got uh, is kind of, uh, uh, don't worry if you haven't got it, because you'll do just fine. In fact, I have a nephew who went to South Dakota State College. He's from Del Rapids, and for he went for one day, one class, and he's, he just said, I've got to get out of here. So he went back to Del Rapids, and he's one of the most successful businessmen. And then I see a cousin of mine, John Clausen, out there, who's a, who's a very prominent uh, uh, young businessman from Sioux Falls. And uh, so I keep seeing people. But uh, in any event, no, I forgot what your question was. My question was, <laughs> when did you first know you would pursue a career in public service? Oh, okay. Well, uh, I guess from Dr. Farber and the government department at the University of South Dakota, I first got the concept of maybe public service, but, uh, and I think that back in those days, Drs. Farber and Geary, and I'm sure you do this now, uh, uh, very much so, to tell people about the possibility of getting a job in government or uh, and uh, uh, I uh, took the uh, I took the steps to join the Foreign Service, and I was in it for three years. But I got very frustrated with the jobs I was given, and, or I thought. Uh, uh, and uh, I was working on general agreement on trade and tariffs and schedules, and uh, so I decided that maybe this wasn't for me. So I, and then my dad got sick about that time. He got some al early Alzheimer's, and uh, 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 he was kind of in and out for several years there. And uh, I was supposed to try to help him out a little bit. So uh, anyway, in any event, I uh, eventually ran for the U.S. House in, the, in a year when no Republicans wanted to run. And I still am a registered Republican, incidentally, although I've just uh, recently I endorsed uh, uh, Billy Sutton because I think uh, we need a little competition in, in peer. We didn't get it. But what did I think during election night? I guess that was the question you asked me. I'm get, trying to get around. Well, I was watching that uh, race closely, trying to, hoping that South Dakota would get, we, we really need to have a two-party system in this state to help us economically. We're not doing as well economically as other states. We're not doing as well as Minnesota or, I mean, they got, it's just as cold in Minnesota. Everybody says, well, it's so cold in South Dakota, we can't have a lot of new businesses. But Minnesota does, and uh, so does a lot of other places. But I think the reason is that we need a competitive political system, and, uh, uh, and I think uh, uh, my cousin John Clausen, who's very active in the Democratic Party in Sioux Falls, and I thank you very much for doing that. You're, aren't you one of the officers in the county of... Vice Chair of the County Party. Vice Chair of the Party County, he's moving up. <laughs> so. <laughs> that's a good, that's a good line. <laughs> moving down, okay, great. Uh, but anyway, I was watching the election returns, and I was reassured that our system works. You know, we're in better shape in this country than we say so. Everybody says we're, we're going to, to going, I've got to be careful I don't say anything politically incorrect now, I'm on a university campus, but uh, that the country is going to the dogs, or it's, it's going downhill. You know, I, I remember growing up at that farm, 
in the 1950s, when I first became politically aware, um, we would listen to Whitey Larson giving the news from WNAX. And he would talk in this real grim voice every night about the war in Korea that's insoluble and about the Army McCarthy hearings and Senator Munt. Well, I was just becoming politically aware. Senator Munt was chairing, had been pushed, had, had been moved into the chairmanship of that committee because um, uh, Senator McCarthy was no longer considered uh, deemed appropriate to chair it. But people thought each other were communists and they had the lists for, out of Hollywood and. Uh, 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 and I, I was a little more aware of that because they would play some of the hearings on WNAX radio, which we listened to uh, there on the farm in the evenings. And uh, then we had all the civil rights, pro our country had a lot of uh, civil rights problems and uh, uh, we were struggling and the, especially the Korean War was just going on and on. This was another war. We just got out of one war, now we're starting another one. But Whitey Larson would give the news every night in a very grim voice and then he would give the weather and it was always like it's uh, cold and gusty winds up to 80 miles an hour tonight or something like that. So it was kind of a, it wasn't a positive, uh, you could easily get depressed, but I never did because we had all kinds of 4-H animals and stuff and we thought it was great actually. We, did, we didn't know how poor we, we, we were, did we Dave? We, we, we thought we were the center of the earth, didn't we? Or at least I did and I thought everything revolved around Humboldt in those days, but I learned later that wasn't necessarily true. But in any event, um, uh, I would say to young people, number one, you do need to earn a living for your family and yourself, and you have to think about that. And, uh, and uh, there's nothing wrong with going out and going into business and, and uh, uh, making some money and, and getting yourself established before you join a foundation or, or, or do whatever, as Ted, Ted, Ted Munster probably apparently took took that approach, uh, and uh, uh, so it, many of you will follow many different paths, but I didn't know, I did not plan, or I did not envisage ever becoming a United States Senator in those days, because there wasn't any, a path to it, uh, that there wasn't, as they say, as I guess in these presidential races, uh, Donald Trump says she has no path to the presidency now, or something like that. So anyway, I saw no path to, uh, but I did want to do in public service. I did get into the Foreign Service, and they paid young Foreign Service officers an adequate wage. Uh, but uh, it just, I bounced around quite a bit and ricocheted about, and I'm still ricocheting about at age 76, almost 77. So I'm still ricocheting about, uh, and uh, 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 we just ricocheted. We had a big family gathering the other day, and. Uh, Sioux Falls and tell your mother how what a great event that was uh, I saw people I hadn't seen and uh, let's see uh, 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 Dave uh, Lias you pro probably don't even remember the Holloways some cousins of mine I hadn't seen them in 40 years and they bought new outfits just to come to this event <laughs> it was a special event I guess it was a wonderful thing so anyway uh, so my theme or my message is that if you do choose public service, whether it's working for a city or being a town planner in Sioux Falls, as one, one of my cousins is, or working for a foundation as Ted Munster did, or whatever, you get part of your pay is that extra thrill when you read the newspaper, or even if you're not in it, you, you know how that came about or whatever, or you helped, helped in that a little bit. And uh, so it's a yearning to help out. And I still have that yearning. I gotta figure out how to, how to get it done. So, but anyway, I'm on this one foundation now and we, are on, we do think that we can eradicate leprosy, but it's, it's very hard to do. Uh, so I guess, I guess as I was watching the election returns, going back to your original question, what this is all about, is what was I thinking about? I think things are working pretty good in our country. We have, we uh, had these elections and they had, uh, operated about as we had expected. Uh, the the outer party uh, loses 27 seats on, on the uh, time, like there were about 23 to 25 that changed hands. I was surprised, I think in Iowa, they, they, they elected two more 
Democrats. They replaced two Republicans. If I does anybody here from Iowa can is that true? Uh, pardon? You replaced three Republicans? Yeah. Really? Yeah. All except Steve King. Yeah. Yeah. All the Iowa delegation were voted out except Steve King. I thought he was the only one who was going to be voted out. <laughs> <laughs> Really? How did that happen in, in Iowa? Just tell me in a sentence or two, because I thought Iowa was going the other way. Um, well, we were just debating that in class with Dr. Ernst, so I think we were really announced of it. No, you go ahead, Rose. Tell us. No, but three, uh, in the state of Iowa, you have four Republican congressmen and two Republican senators. Now, today we've got three Democratic congressmen, and Steve King is still there. Okay, now how did that happen? I mean, it might be terrorists from the, from the trade war because Iowa has a huge fighting market. I see, I see. Or just to see that Iowa's always been purple and sometimes it will swing really red and sometimes yeah. it will swing red. Yeah. That's just kind of how Iowa is. Yeah. But they're all basically centrists, aren't they? I mean, uh, out here in the Midwest, I think all of our politicians believe about the same. In fact, I think uh, Billy Sutton might have been the more conservative candidate for governor in some ways, mm -hmm. strangely enough. Yeah. yeah. So I better let shut me, up here and no, answer. No, let me, let me, let me, but, I, I was but, intrigued. Uh, so, so my theme is I'm a bland, Midwestern, middle of the road, not a Methodist, that would give me another M. But uh, uh, I'm, a, I'm, a, I'm a, so I've got to have a, people tell me you've got to have a theme, you've got to have a message. Well, I guess my message is that I had a great time in the government department here, and I'm very grateful to what you're doing. And uh, I'm, I, but I guess uh, I was inspired in part uh, by uh, Farber and uh, Dr. Gary and Dr. Clem, who just passed away recently. And uh, there were some others, but there are also great ones in the history department and uh, everywhere down here. There's a mathematician, uh, Mahaffey, taught mathematics and. You have good professors here at the University of South Dakota. We tend to underrate ourselves, being from South Dakota. The uh, Leonard Harkness, who used to be the state 4-H leader in Minnesota, he would say that, uh, he would talk to John Younger, and he'd say, if you have the Minnesota-South Dakota line, you have a young man who grows up on a farm in South Dakota, he'll be rather meek and modest and so forth. The one from Minnesota will announce for president when he's 10 years old. <laughs> um, so uh, we've got to think more of ourselves. Or we should, and I, I don't mean that people in South Dakota are meek or modest, but we underrate ourselves. Let me, let me just follow up. Do, yeah. do I understand that you think of yourself as being bland? Yes, <laughs> definitely. <laughs> okay. <laughs> I'm not sure that would be an adjective I'd okay. use to describe you, Larry. Okay. Um, but let me, you know, you mentioned uh, how you felt like the politics of the 50s, or at least the, the, the civil discourse of the 50s, was in some respects worse than now. Do you feel like the civil discourse today discourages young people from seeking public service? Yes, I do, because uh, of the stuff you can get uh, in, uh, accused of uh, overnight on, uh, anonymously on the, the Facebook or something, and uh, that's the way it is. But I would say to you young people, if, if that's who I'm, and to anybody old here, is, is, uh, is that, and, and, and is that the problems of today are very similar to, our country has always had these problems. Thomas Jefferson bought a newspaper to, or newspaper ads to give what he knew were false information about John Adams, although they later became friends. Uh, in the 1950s, when I was listening to Whitey Larson give the news on WNAX, and even Kevin Schieffer can't remember that. He was out goofing around. He, he wasn't listening to the evening news, but Whitey Larson would come on and talk about the Army McCarthy hearings and how everybody's accusing everybody of being a communist or, or they, uh, and Ronald Reagan did provide a list or did, did testify. Remember, uh, I didn't know who Ronald Reagan was uh, then, but uh, this thing was really nasty in the 1950s, from about 1952 to 58. And the Korean War, every day, and we had a guy from Humboldt who got killed in the Korean War. And God, he'd been in World War II, didn't get killed there, he went to Korea. One of the jardings, I think, uh, correct me if, if I'm wrong, I've got the editor of the paper here. Uh, 
but I think that the challenges that we have is we've made a lot of progress. We are making progress in civil rights. We're making progress economically, and I hope we're making progress educationally. Uh, but um, uh, this is not this is not the. Uh, uh, I think we're in better shape than we're in. I think there are great opportunities for young people in public service and in private enterprise, and you just have to find your way. But I don't buy into all this instant CNN, uh, uh, Fox News superficiality about everything is a crisis, and we have to work through them. Now, some problems are insoluble. Would you believe that? Uh, uh, I would. I'm going to, because as a pu public policymaker, all right, we just had a terrible gun killing again in uh, California. But whatever the facts are, I don't know. But. Uh, the thing is that if you talk to anybody at a cocktail party or something, they'll have a solution to the gun problem. But if you change this scenario to what it really is, we've got more guns than people in the country. We're a culture that loves the Second Amendment more than the First. Uh, they got the, fir the First Amendment up outside of the Newhart Center. And some fellow said, well, why don't you have the Second Amendment there? Well, anyway, they don't. But. Uh, um, the point is we got saddled with that Second Amendment because the, the, the people didn't want, the British wouldn't let people have guns in certain circumstances. And all of our constitutions out of the Revolutionary War, uh, the, there's actually still a constitutional amendment in on the books, and correct me if I'm wrong, Professor, but it says we can't quarter, we, you don't have to quarter troops in your home. Well, that was strictly aimed at the British would come to town and and take over your house and uh, cook themselves a nice meal and so forth. Um, so that constitution is, I don't know why people are, revere it so much because it's nice to have it, but England doesn't have a constitution and uh, uh, it's just, to, but the second amendment, but we've got the second amendment and we've got more guns than people. So you have to give the, give the facts that we're starting with in terms of solving it. Okay then, but every case there's an exception. Well they say, now, out in California, they got an anti-assault weapon and, and, and they have gun control or whatever it is, but that fellow still had a gun. Uh, then they say, well, uh, uh, then the other side says, well, then we need to have a carry, uh, a secret carry provision so you can, everybody, if they want to, they can conceal, they could be sitting here tonight with a weapon in their <coughs> pocket. Right here, maybe I've got one, who knows? But, uh, no, I don't, but it's my wallet, <laughs> my, my empty wallet thumping. Uh, so the, the theory is that in a church, a gunman couldn't go in and be assured that there's nobody with a gun there, because there might be some fellow who's got a concealed weapon that he carries, and he could shoot back. Because where most of these shootings take place are where they're sure that there aren't any, there's not anybody who can shoot back. But then that solution wouldn't work for the Las Vegas shooting. Um, and uh, so we have to do a little bit of everything, I think, to keep working on this. More background checks, more, uh, we're gonna have to restrict w w where people can carry guns uh, or something. Uh, eventually we're gonna have to uh, address this more and more. Uh, but there, th there are some problems that, that are just insoluble. You, you can't uh, write a, uh, a complete solution to it. There's a professor at George Washington who writes these cases up for uh, very difficult problems that a public policy person, a legislator or whatever you got, he's got one on there that uh, a young lady uh, joins the Navy and she gets on the submarine and she gets out three weeks and she discovers, and she's on a six month cruise and she wants to have an abortion, she tells the commanding officer. So what steps should be taken, question mark. You write the exam for the next hour and mm -hmm. give the solution. Well, there is no one solution there, it's a, because there's all kinds of things you run into. No federal funds can be used for abortions. Uh, you, you can't discriminate against a woman for blah, 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 and so forth. Uh, so the, but that's part of the thrill of public policy is that you, you, you get the toughest problems. Now, a lot of people, they say, well, businessmen know how to do things. What businessmen do are, is, is much simpler. They need to make a profit. Uh, what public policy people, what you are going to have to do is much more complex. You're going to have to work on things like gun control and different things. 
and they require a rigorous dealing with the facts that we've got today, and you're given a certain set of facts, and we're all given a certain set of facts in our lives, we're who we are, and then we've got to do the best we can from there on out. But if you choose public policy at different times during your life, we also have this thing in the United States where you can be in the revolving door to some extent, and I, I see nothing wrong with that. Uh, I'm bothered by the lobbying part of it and the money. But uh, uh, in France, you, you read, you, you're more, and I've uh, taught at Sciences Po, that's one of their administration, public administration schools, you really make a distinct choice if you're gonna be a public servant or a foreign service officer or you really don't change or a businessman uh, uh, and you don't float back and forth. Uh, but here in the United States, we do. You can go to work for the state of South Dakota and um, um, have a business and, uh, and do, do mix the two together a little bit in some cases. But I guess my message, the message, the message that I've tried to figure out how to convey it today is that what Farber and, and uh, Gary and Clem and those guys used to say and what you're saying now today I probably is that the, the thrill of doing something with a public purpose and the struggle of that, the struggle is probably harder to do that and you'll get paid less, but you'll get paid off with the, the thrill of having done some things. And for example, I'm gonna be a little self-serving here, I spent almost seven years working on one bill, that was the Telecommunications Act of 96. And I'm probably the only guy who knows it, but we would not have cell phones the way we do today if it weren't for that, because we could move information across. Otherwise, we'd have, uh, we'd still have computers, but they'd be limited geographically. They wouldn't be worldwide because of that act. And that gives me a great deal of satisfaction. But I don't think anybody else knows that anymore. But anyway, I do. So. Uh, and my wife does because I told her, but uh, uh, anyway. So, so, so you have those little thrills in your old age uh, that are a form of payment, but, your bank, but it doesn't do much for your bank account. How can young people get started in public service? What's, what are some of the right ways to get started, do you think? Well, you can apply for a job to be the, <clears throat> they used to have the city manager of Yankton, South Dakota. Did they still have a city management system in Yankton, or did they abandon that? Did they still have a uh, city manager in Yankton, and the city manager in Yankton is Amy Nelson currently. Oh, great. Now, is there an assistant city manager? I am not aware that there is. Well, you could apply for the job to be assistant city manager if it existed, for example. I, I'm saying this because I'm raising up local public administration. It's very important. Cities, counties, a county commissioner in Minnehaha County, that's a major responsibility as it is in any county. And uh, uh, the, uh, uh, the amount of, they're, they're really dealing with the, that's really the infantry. Senators are back in Washington, but the, to try to, define who gets those welfare payments and who, uh, who takes care of the jail and all that stuff, plus all the good things about education. And a lot of it's very glorious and uplifting, uplifting as liberal arts are in, in, in general. The government department is part of the School of Liberal Arts. I think we've got the dean of the School of Liberal Arts here. And uh, 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 I think that maybe your government majors, you, you probably train them to think critically because they're not really trained to do any specific job. But you could go out and you say, how do you get started? Well, you apply for a job in the, in the government or you take the civil service exam. Now, do they still have the civil service exam where you take it and then they, you're qualified or they, do they still have that? Oh, I think so, yeah. And you can take the foreign service exam uh, or you can apply to your congressman or senator uh, who... Uh, or to do some volunteer work. Now, I'll tell you the story about one guy that Kevin Schieffer knows, and this guy would not approve of me saying, there's a young man called Todd Troutman. He's not so young anymore. Uh, I'm so, like, I, I the, the other night, they're watching it, I, I thought to myself, they should not let anybody vote until they're 70 years old in this country. <laughs> that's, that's what I was thinking. But Todd Troutman is from Eureka, South Dakota and he went to Northern College. 
I've got to be careful. It's university. Politically correct. I've got it fixed. And he volunteered in a, I had a little office up in, uh, in uh, uh, Aberdeen, and he volunteered to work in that. And we eventually paid him a little bit. And he eventually came to Washington, D.C., where he was mainly Kevin Schieffer's assistant. Uh, but t uh, Kevin trained him to do certain things. And uh, after I left the Senate, he got a job via my wife and Trisha Lott on the Senate and myself to, uh, to work in a certain office up in the Senate, administrative offices. And he is now the head of the whole, he's the doorkeeper or the whatever they call it. The, the, and he's down there on the Senate floor. So I go up to the Senate, I'm sitting up there and he's down there on the floor and I'm not there. And, uh, but he's a guy just, he never thought of coming to Washington. He never thought of, uh, he was a man of uh, not uh, magnificent dreams, but he's really done well. I'm just pointing to you. Did I say that right, Kevin? Add anything to that story. That you, but, to, but I, but I saw a time. He, he wasn't my assistant. Um, uh, he was his own man, and you never let me have any assistance. <laughs> <laughs> but he's he's uh, done uh, extraordinarily well. But and and I saw him last time I was up in the Senate gallery. I take guests over there once in a while. And I get to I get a pass to the gallery now, and uh, Todd was down there, and the only United States senator who was there that day was Senator Rockefeller of West Virginia, who is, his health is suffering a great deal right now. But I said to Todd afterwards, I mean, Todd was on the floor doing, fixing the papers or whatever that they do. And uh, I said to him, you know, I was thinking, you, Todd Trautman, from Eureka, South Dakota, and, uh, and his mother worked in this, uh, served, uh, meals in the high school there in Eureka, you have come much further in life than Jay Rockefeller, because Jay Rockefeller, well, he, he's going to be more important when he gets out of the Senate. The rest of us are less, or we're, we're forgotten quickly. But if you're a Rockefeller, you, you're going uh, uh, you, to be doing great things all your life anyway. But I said to Todd, you come much further in life from Eureka, South Dakota, to being doorkeeper of the U.S. Senate or do doorman, there's they got all kinds of titles. These are big jobs, and like when they have the inauguration for the president, they march out and all this kind of stuff. And uh, he knows all the senators by name. Uh, a little guy from Eureka South. So how did he get started? Well, he walked into a congressman's office and volunteered uh, in the field office without mm -hmm. any remote idea of coming to Washington. And I don't know quite how all that came about, but. Uh, uh, I say, don't be like the Leonard Harkness example of the boy who grew up on the South Dakota side of the fence and had a low self-esteem. The guy a mile away on the Minnesota side had announced he was going to be president of the United States by the time he was 10 years old. Uh, so we want to, there, there are great opportunities there. You just have to go out and scramble for them, I guess. And why is life so difficult? That's a secular, that's a, uh, it's a it's a scramble for everybody, whether you're in business or what you're in. I mean, it's a, God has created us, uh, I believe, uh, for some purpose. But uh, I get upset with Him because uh, why did He make it so tough, or why did He make the world so difficult? But anyway, that's another that's for another. Yeah, seminar. We, we need the philosophy department uh, okay, to help us with that we'll question. Philosophy, yes. um, so classics department. Let, let's let's focus on so particular. How do you get started? You you walk in and apply. And I might also say, and maybe I'll embarrass Kevin here, but when he first came to Washington, I believe he was so poor that he was sleeping in his own car. Is that correct, Kevin? Or shouldn't I have said that? It was somebody else's car. <laughs> <laughs> okay, great. Okay. So let's let's focus on a particular form of public service, which is elected. Right now he's on the board of regents of this. He rules over everything that's in, within sight. <laughs> I'm sleeping in my car. <laughs> 
But let's focus on elected office because you have uh, a lot of interesting experience in elected office. Uh, as I was looking at the returns on Tuesday night, I noted uh, one statistic that struck me as uh, noteworthy. The two candidates uh, for the major parties in the Florida Senate election, between them spent $91 million. How do young people get started in a world with that much money going into campaigns? Well, you know, I don't know. It's just really uh, difficult. And uh, uh, I reference you, uh, I'm talking about Dave Lias too much, but look at his article of about a week ago in which he talked about being a volunteer in my first campaign when we didn't have very much money. I don't think that you could do that anymore, could you? I, I, I don't think that, that somebody could do that. But he was a volunteer at South Dakota State College where he was a student and he would pass out my literature. So uh, you have to find a Dave Lias to support you. But uh, I'm very worried that it's very hard to, but you can still run, you can still uh, run. In South Dakota, we have retail politics. Uh, in, 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 South, in South Dakota, if you really put your mind to it, you can shake a lot of hands, not as many hands as I claim to have uh, shaken in uh, Dr. Clem's book, but uh, uh, you can run for the state legislature or, for, or the, for the Congress, if you want, or for the Senate or for Whatever, but uh, we do we do still have in this state a lot of retail politics. But you got to still get the money because uh, uh, at the at the end of the day, negative ads and negative messaging. Negative messaging is almost worse than negative TV ads. Negative messaging on Facebook, false negative messaging, and. Um, uh, Billy Sutton, who used to get me horses for the, the, when I would ride out in parades in the West River, they'd have to find a very calm horse so I wouldn't fall off in front of the crowds. But his family used to always help me out with uh, getting a nice tame horse. But in any event, there was a lot of messaging defining him as a liberal. Uh, and uh, I suppose there were unfair messaging towards Mrs. Noam also <clears throat> on the other side. But that messaging, whether it's on Facebook or, or anything else, is very expensive. And you've got to have a very expensive public relations firm that's ready to change the message or ready to buy that ad when the World Series go beyond 15 innings or whatever happened. You, somebody's got to be on the trigger to get your message in there, um, and that's expensive. Uh, so I don't know. That's a that, that's a problem that I don't know if uh, uh, we're, we're going to solve. Eventually, I, I, I hope our Supreme Court and our Congress will limit spending again. But that's a that's a problem that. Uh, I don't have a solution to it. it's a simple solution because every solution I come up with has a checkmate to it. Yeah, well, and I should note that that 91 million was the extreme value in the gubernatorial race in uh, South Dakota. The two candidates spent about four million, so the problems in South Dakota are not quite as on that same order, but it, it, it's still a lot of money. But I wanted to follow up because you noted about uh, Facebook and the importance of messaging both you know, the, the, the challenge of negative messaging. Um, in, in the room here, we have a number of stu students who are in the media and journalism fields and are very much interested uh, in working in the fourth estate. Um, how should journalists reconsider how they do their job? Do they need to reconsider how they do their job given the emergence of social media and the nature of media today? Well, I think that we need good independent journalists more than we need political people, so to speak. And I would say that going into journalism is a form of public service, perhaps of the highest calling. But the problem, as I, today at noon, the students pointed out, journalists, I said, how much do journalists make? And you said very clearly, $12 an hour, $12 an hour. Well, you can't, uh, you can't even rent an apartment in Humboldt for what you'd make uh, for, for that amount. Uh, and that's Humboldt, South Dakota. Not, Humboldt, Iowa is very rich. Uh, I, I know some of our Iowa students here. This is Humboldt, South Dakota, where the humble boys come from. Um, but um, uh, it is truly 
amazing to me uh, how little journalists are paid, but also journalists have to declare that they're of the right or of the left to get a good job. Uh, if you can get onto Fox News on, t on television, you'll make good money, but uh, uh, we're just, uh, things are just dying out, the papers. The, I tried to get a hold of an Argus leader this morning because I wanted to read who had won the state and local races. We uh, had a kind of a hotly contested state senate race. Mm -hmm. We elected Deb Peters, and then we elected a Democrat this time because the other fellow had said some things that if they were used or passed by the legislature, we would never get another basketball tournament to come to South Dakota. But in any event, so we did get uh, a, a positive result there in the state senate race in the Hartford Humboldt area. Um, but uh, it's very hard to get journalists who can report. But uh, my point was that the Irish leader didn't even have the results of the Minnehaha County elections this year. They, they skipped that because they have so few pages of news. And it's because of the economics, I guess. But the newspapers are gone. Now, uh, Jack Marsh and others are trying to form a foundation. But I am very dubious about some of the things they're doing. Uh, it's part of the old Gannett crowd, uh, which I'm not too high on. Um, but in any event, there is an effort to try to get people to give money to hire journalists. Well, it depends on which journalists they hire, I guess. Or this, this, this whole thing is just not the way a newspaper should be. Should be. So I would say to young people who want to go into journalism, and we have several here, the chairman who introduced us. Uh, there is a tradition of majoring in government and journalism, or some combination thereof. And I think uh, maybe uh, Tom Brokaw was part of that. And uh, uh, we've had several, and Al Newharth uh, uh, was probably part of that in the old days. This, this is ancient history. But going forward today, from today forward, we need journalists, and we've got to pay them s some real money but there just aren't that many jobs because people will put it on the internet for free. And uh, 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 so that's another almost insoluble problem because we need good journalists writing about the results of the Minnehaha County elections are not, in, they weren't in election night, that's understandable, they weren't ready, they weren't in, to, I thought for sure they'd be in today's paper, but apparently the results of the Minnehaha County elections are not going to be published in the Argus Leader. Uh, and we're part of Minnehaha County there in Humboldt, although a forgotten part over there. But um, uh, I thought that was extraordinary. That there's, there's an irony that the national uh, uh, campaigns get more press coverage than the local campaigns when it's the local office holders who may have the most direct impact on our daily lives. Yes. Everybody know, knows who the, the mayor of New York is when it's Rudy Giuliani. But nobody knows who the mayor of Humboldt is, uh, or uh, or Sioux Falls. Uh, they know the uh, the national news ones, and so. But it's very frustrating because I think we need local public administration. We need good people going into government. Uh, your brother is a planner there in Sioux Falls. Your son, your son, yes, your son, is a planner. That's what a wonderful job that would be. And there are parts of Sioux Falls that. I've never been in. I discovered the idea it's grown so much. So anyway, I'm making my answers much too long. I'm they're, sorry. They're fascinating. No, okay. thank you. Um, we're going to open it up to questions in one minute. But the, the last question I'll ask before we invite the audience to ask, um, in any profession, but I think certainly in public service, there, uh, all of us need uh, uh, mentors and role models. I'm just wondering, were there, when you were in the Army, when you were in the Foreign Service, and then when you were in the Congress, were there particular individuals that you thought uh, personified the highest ideals of public service? Well, uh, you know, I think Dr. Alan Clem, uh, let, let me put a, a word in for you professors and educators and deans, and I got the honor of meeting the president of the university today. Um, um, you do a lot of good, and you have a key role to play, and I hope our state, that's one of my problems with the um, uh, Republican Party of South Dakota. I am a Republican, but our, the core of the Republican Party seems to think that we need to, that, uh, that, uh, that job development is 
creating uh, low-wage jobs and getting people locked into them, uh, such as welders, which I would like to be, incidentally. My nephew has a welding shop, and I'm going to take a welding class. Uh, that's for a number of reasons, but uh, uh, artistic reasons, I think. But um, uh, the idea on education is to get, uh, they think, is to su supply a, a vocational um, uh, and vocational education is very important. I'm a champion of it, but their idea is to get people locked into, while still in school, the, 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 the state government uh, has these programs that people can, can go to vocational school for, for free if, they, if they'll stay there. Well, then you, but they're not going to be a welder the rest of their lives, or the, the, that doesn't lead to anything. It could, it could and it should, in the, the, way the, the way the Germans do the trades for high quality pr production and so forth. But that mentality has, uh, that I feel our state Republican Party, the core of it is business. I, think, I wish they'd pay, pay the higher wages or something, but there's an idea that education in, should supply low wage workforce people into uh, uh, certain skills and uh, in certain ways. And, and uh, I think a two party system here might change that to some extent more to the way of thinking that goes on in Minnesota. Here, I'm really getting in trouble here. I'm sounding like a, I've got to have the Republican Party has to re rehabilitate my, me. That's one, one of my old friends told me that I need rehabilitation, but uh, rehab <laughs> to get uh, back to the conservative principles. But in any event, uh, uh, what I'm getting to, what I'm trying to say is that we need to salute the professors and, and we need to appreciate you for what you do. And we had, uh, as I said, uh, kind of a group of them there, but Alan Clem had a, had a certain idealism about him. He was a professor here, that you should do what's right. And there's, uh, uh, there's an old uh, Mormon hymn that says, do the right, <laughs> whatever that is. You've got to figure out what it is. And, uh, um, I pray occasionally, and but God never answers. He, he never, I never hear him giving me a specific answer, so it's a real struggle. But uh, that's we're we're human beings. But in any event, you professors do a lot to promote public service, to promote journalism, or to promote working in foundations. In addition to, it's not inconsistent to go into business. A lot of the Farber Fund guys went into business, or they uh, they. Uh, because you've got to have some money to, to do something uh, with the Farber Fund and so forth, or, or the practicing law or whatever. Uh, um, Lance Boltina, I think, is able to contribute a lot more than I am uh, because he's, uh, he wouldn't appreciate my, maybe he's here. I, I don't keep seeing people that I know from past incarnations. But anyway, so I hope I've answered that. But so. Uh, how do you get a job? You go out and get one. You go out and ask for it. You, you, nobody's going to give it to you. Uh, or you volunteer, as Todd Troutman did, or you. Uh, but you follow the principles of, that the and the, the the government department at the University of South Dakota has kind of a storied history in this state, if I may say so. Uh, and I majored in that kind of by accident almost. I was thinking about history and so forth, and would Farber. Clearly, he said you got to be in, you got to be a government major, but uh, you, you 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 you're marching in a long line of what I think are great women and men. And of course, we had Mary Pat Byerly was teaching over there. Yeah. Maybe she's here. She's around sometimes. But anyway, I've talked enough. Well, thank you. Thank you for thank you for, thank you you for promoting professors in the department, and uh, yeah. I've got a nice gratuity for you afterwards. Okay. Um, Ramon Ramon Rosario, a PhD thank student you. in political science. Uh, thank you. Um, we got question. a PhD in political science here now. I'm glad to hear that. Uh, awesome. Good. <laughs> how, how long have we had that? Uh, I don't know, a decade Years. or so. Okay. A little over a decade. Okay. Uh, yes. Thank you. Um, my question. I think that um, the due process is very important. I think that in a lot of countries you do not have due process, and that's why we, many of us immigrate here, because you guys in America, we do. Um, what role do you think the media and politicians should play respecting due process and not getting entangled with politics and um, political agendas 
And if you can talk about uh, the recent case with, uh, with the Supreme Court justice, like, uh, the new one coming out, um, but what, what are your thoughts on that? Are, term, are, are the media too quick to reach conclusions? Are they not observing sort of principles of due process on some of these stories? Well, um, I think so, and I think the media has discredited itself to some extent in being so anti-Trump. Now, um, I've got a lot of problems, as everybody does, with some of Trump's tweets and so forth, but he is functioning as a pretty good president in my judgment. Uh, I, I, I read a column every two weeks so I, have, so I can spout off. I don't know if anybody reads them. But um, um, the Trump presidency might go down as a very good presidency in spite of all, but the media just won't give him credit. He's done a good job with North Korea and reaching out and, and uh, diplomatically, if he were a liberal democratic president, they'd be, the New York Times would be praising him and so forth, and there'd be editorials. Uh, so, um, uh, but the, and because then Fox News is on the other side of things, but I think the media has been a little discredited by their own actions, maybe. And uh, due process is very important, but we can't carry it too far. Uh, but um, uh, in this day and age of instant communications, uh, 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 again, it's, it's not a solvable problem, but I think we have to be very careful. But that's why we need good young journalists, and we need to pay them enough and, and get, them, get them into jobs that, uh, that amount to something. But uh, we thank you very much. Uh, you know, the, uh, we, uh, uh, we do need, I'm for more legal immigration, uh, and I sympathize with the president trying to get, get it defined more. Uh, but uh, our country really, and South Dakota in particular, my uh, relatives who are business people over in Del Rapids, especially the one who makes iron gates, he could hire an indefinite number of welders, uh, but uh, the only welders that he gets are uh, from our, our uh, immigrants. And, uh, uh, but this is all over the Southwest, uh, California. Throughout the whole nation, we need not just more immigrants to do the work, but to do the thinking. And we're, we're so enriched by having you here and by uh, that constant, we've been blessed. We've been very lucky as a country, and we're very blessed that we have always taken a lot of immigrants, and I hope we always do. Let's take a question from Devin. Yeah, so we have um, around a couple more minutes left for this question, around two minutes. Um, but my question for you is we talked a lot about um, financing and um, how young people kind of run for office. But my question to you, Senator, is um, just kind of how is running for office different now than when you first ran? Okay, well, I think as, uh, as uh, Dave Lias would say, uh, I think it was a little more retail in those days. And you could make a dent going around and shaking hands with people and handing out literature. But also the debates were a little more substantive, I think. Uh, we actually, actually, actually had debates on uh, uh, real issues sometimes. Some of the debates were on real issues. And it seems as though that you could make a speech and people would listen to it. Uh, that's the problem. You might have a lot of ideas, but I have a very hard time getting audiences. I mean, th this audience is, has listened very patiently, although I see a few nodding off. Uh, uh, but a difference is, uh, it's, it isn't the candidates, but it's the people, and people are less willing to sit down and listen to a public discussion or a forum or something like that. Maybe it's because we have, because what you see on TV is so much, people are so much more articulate and prepared and so forth, and, but that's, a, I think, a difference, and I urge you to attend forums such as this or uh, discussions of the Republican or the Democratic Party. By the way, that's a, I, I, I was not asked this question, but I've come to believe that the American people want to do their business through the Republican or the Democratic Party. We're told that there are more and more people becoming independents, but at the end of the day, when that independent goes into the voting booth, he morphs into a Republican or a Democrat. That's something I, I believe that uh, we could run as independents, but I, 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 I don't think the American, for some mysterious reason, as Arthur Schlesinger said, we like the two-party system, and it, the pendulum swings back and forth, as it did to some extent here the other night. But at the end of the day, the, most of the new Congress are going to be Republicans or Democrats. And so I would, no, my thinking has changed on this 
over the years, but my current thinking as of uh, whatever time it is, five to six or whatever, um, is that you should join, if you want to be active politically, you should join one political party or the other, stick with it, and try to influence them. Like what's probably most needed is moderate Republicans, but you've got to really put up with a lot of going to meetings and uh, so on and so forth. But that might be the best way in my in my thinking today that that would be where the most need is to uh, help. The, but I think both parties should be moderate. And But the American people like to do their business for some mysterious reason through the Republican or the Democratic parties in that. I know we've only got a minute or two left, but you ran as an independent That's in correct. 2014, is that right? That's great. At that point, I thought we were going to have five independents maybe elected to the Senate that year. Things were set up in a certain way, and uh, none of them did. And the fellow from Kansas uh, also ran for governor this last time. He did not win. So the, uh, the that was kind of the, however, there are two United States senators today who call themselves independents, but they actually run. Bernie Sanders really runs as a Democrat. If you look, look into how he does it, he runs and gets Democratic nomination, and then resigns from that, then runs as an independent. It's, it makes some Democrats mad, but you can do that in Vermont. So he's really not, and even uh, our neighbor. But in any event, my thinking of that, I did think that we were on the verge of starting an independent, not party, but a, a, there, there was some, uh, and somehow Donald Trump <laughs> harnessed that, but he did it through the Republican Party. So I think that um, people want to do their business at the end of the day through the Republican or the Democratic Party. Uh, I have come to believe. You, from hard experience, you, you, you grew up in South Dakota. You're a distinguished South Dakota. Professor Dakotan. Ernest. So oh, we're going to have to end the program oh, here okay. now, unfortunately. Um, but thank you, Senator, for being here today, and thank you, Dr. Ernest, My as pleasure. well. Um, and thank you, guys, here to the audience as well for being here today. This is also live streamed, also on the Cross Media Council's Facebook page, so you guys could take a look there. Um, and the Senator is also having an event tomorrow morning at McVicker Plaza as well, so you can feel free to go to that. And um, yeah, for the Cross Media Council, I'm Devin Martin. Have a great night, everybody.